We all live in the digital world. We all need it to be open and safe. We all want to trust. And to be trusted. We all despise control. And desire freedom. We, we are all united. united. Good day to all. My name is Bernadette Lewis, and I'm the Secretary General of the Commonwealth Telecommunications Organization, or the CTO. And it is my pleasure to welcome you to the CTO's first hard talk for action discourse. The CTO is the Commonwealth's oldest intergovernmental ICT organization. We have restructured the CTO's operations to support our members in formulating, accelerating, and successfully implementing their digital transformation programs. Hard Talk for Action will be addressing the topic, fostering meaningful connectivity for digital transformation. Meaningful connectivity encompasses universal, affordable access to broadband networks and devices, and the ability of all citizens to use the network facilities and devices safely. It speaks to the availability of appropriate content, applications, and services for enhancing everyday life of the citizen. When we speak of digital transformation, we are referring to the process that integrates digital technology into all aspects of a nation's uh, activities, changing the operations of its people and systems to deliver value. Now, it's very easy to talk, and we've heard of many wonderful ICT plans and strategies. But what we need are the tools and approaches for accelerated action in achieving universal broadband connectivity and digital 21st century governments. The provocateur for our hard talk for action is Professor Tim Unwin. He is holder of the UNESCO Chair in ICT for Development. He is also the EF. Emeritus Professor of Geography at Royal Holloway University of London. He's also the former Secretary General of the CTO, and he's the author of the book, Reclaiming Information and Communication Technologies for Development. Professor Unwin will separate the wheat from the chaff. He'll mill and refine the substance of the discussions into practical advice for all who are seeking to accelerate meaningful connectivity for digital transformation. Professor Unwin, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Secretary General. It, it's a real honor to be invited back to uh, support you in this really important agenda. I, I don't think, I, I, I think I'm really just the timekeeper making sure everything runs smoothly. But uh, if everyone keeps the time, uh, I hope I will be able to summarize at the end. Let me just make uh, three or four introductory points. The first is we want this session to be interesting, lively, and actually enjoyable. I'm not just rolling out the same old platitudes that we seem to hear in, in, in events such as the IGF all too often. We have four incredible speakers um, and they will focus first on political will, second on economics, and then thirdly satellites, fourthly 5G. But this is very much from a Commonwealth perspective. 54 countries from all the continents of the world uh, with some similar traditions behind them. And especially focusing on the Caribbean. And uh, I think this is increasingly of wider relevance because uh, representative of the SIDS, the small island developing states, which all too often seem to me to get left behind in our discussions. I will only introduce the speakers very, very briefly. You can follow their distinguished profiles uh, on uh, the, the web. 
Um, and uh, I'm afraid I, those of you know me, I can see there are some friends on, on uh, the, in the participants list. I'll be using a yellow card to warn them there's a minute to go and a red card uh, when we'll politely ask them to be quiet. Um, and we'll see how that goes. Um, His Excellency Minister Hassel Bacchus uh, has to leave before the end of something called a, a cabinet meeting or something like that. And these are important things that some politicians have to attend. So I will be asking him a question immediately after his 10 minutes. Uh, and then the others, I, I will have a concluding session with them, uh, challenging uh, each of them one or, or, or two points. Hopefully, uh, if we keep to time, there'll be uh, opportunity for uh, the participants also to engage in some questions. And please do put those on the chat. We'll try and answer those as we go along. So without more ado, and, and I just say thank you, Commonwealth Telecommunications Organization for this really important session. It is about how we turn rhetoric into reality and make a difference, particularly to the lives of the poorest and the most marginalized. So uh, your excellency, um, Hassel Bacchus, you are Minister of Digital Transformation, as I'm sure you know, uh, from the wonderful Republic of Trinidad and Tobago. And uh, your 10 minutes is on. Culture. But the ones that I think that make the most impact here, at least in the Caribbean, would be political change because our, our political our governments tend to change every so often. And that has happened within the Caribbean fairly recently in a number of places. And then, of course, there is the question of if I am back on this revolutionary type of transformation. What does it do to my chances to remain as the governing body of, of this particular entity? And that is a very powerful thing. There are a number of really great initiatives that have not happened because when you look at the potential consequence from backlash from the populace, they don't work. So I'm just using those to show why some of the things don't happen and why 21st century governance doesn't necessarily happen and people tend to be stuck admired in where they were all the time. In, in Trinidad, the ministry, the way we've set it up, and this is just furthering the political will, we're really working across three, three big vertical pillars. We're dealing with digital government, uh, the digital economy, and of course, a digital society. And the way the ministry is set up to work with all of the other ministries, divisions, agencies, uh, stakeholder partners, et cetera, it's built that way so that there is this, this, this crescendo of, of, of effort. But the ministry is not doing it all. It's kind of like we, we're facilitating all of that happening together. And so it's while there is political will, there is a stakeholder buy-in. And I think once the government starts by proving it wants to do it, I think the buy-in comes along uh, not to, yeah, right behind that. Um, there are some guiding principles that, that will work in terms of engendering political will and doing it in a new way. What, there, there, are, there are many of them, I'll, I'll name a few. One of them in particular is challenging the status quo. People wanting to remain the way they are. People not wanting to make the changes because we, remember, we're trying to influence people, processes, and systems. Systems in this case would include uh, the infrastructure and so on, but also the legislation. People who are mired in the old way of doing things will tend to be resistant. These are the people to the introduction of new digital forward thinking processes that, that are absolutely essential for us to forward this political agenda and or the transformational agenda. So uh, having the support of ministries like the Ministry of Public Administration, where a lot of the rules and guidelines are built to, to address how uh, customers of these systems work uh, is key. So that's just one of them. There are lots of others, lateral thinking, agility, uh, user experience, you know, end-to-end uh, -end delivery of things and things. All of these things have to be bottled into it. But challenging the status quo is one that really requires to fix it. You really require to have a lot of uh, political will where that is concerned. What is the mandate that is going to get that you're going to get at the end of this if the political will and all the other things come together? Here in Trinidad and to be created our own uh, statement of it, and I'll just read it just so everyone can get it. It's a new way to address the end to end consumption and delivery of goods and services to customers using appropriate digital technology. I think I'll put a patent on it. It seems whenever I say it, people tend to like it because of the components of it. A new way it speaks to a number of things. End to end speaks to a number of things. Customers in this case is also critical because it's not just the people who consume the services, but also the people who deliver them. And of course, appropriate digital technology is key. The government of Trinidad and Tobago has, has deemed uh, broadband as a public good. So it is 
very much like electricity and water, a lot of the things that we have to do in the digital transformation space is based on having ubiquitous broadband uh, across for all citizens, divisions, agencies, for everyone to use. And that is uh, exactly what we set out to do through a number of things. There are some core values that drive what we're dealing with specifically as it relates to, to uh, the government and its will to continue. For, for a ministry of this type that deals in so much transformation, two of them in particular are quite strange. So in the core values in the Ministry of Digital Transformation are driving what we're doing, uh, two of them are trust and hope. And it is essential because you have to, if we're gonna make the type of cultural change that we want, we even with all the political will in the world, people have to believe and trust and hope that what you're going to do is gonna work. And of course, we're gonna to have to engender their trust through of course the establishment of credibility and transparency and so on. So that is, that is absolutely critical. We, are, we have to partner with a number of, of agencies to do this. I think this is going to be true throughout the Commonwealth if you have to do that. Even governments and all the government will in the world won't do it alone. The CTO is an example of one of many organizations to which we have to work with to be able to do what we need to do. Uh, an example of what we're trying to do is it, uh, we've, we've come up with this concept of a connected city. And the interesting thing about it is a connected area, anything. The interesting thing about it is when you look at it, you see these little signals on top of everything. It's the broadband connectivity that is working to make it work. So when we start putting in uh, the appropriate rule and laws and, and, and pieces of guidelines for people to use, uh, pushing people towards using a, a digital type, digital type uh, instruments to do what they want, the, there are significant levels of increases of digital, uh, your digital, digital literacy of your, of your population that has to increase. You have to be able to then have the necessary frameworks and infrastructure for that to happen. And then of course, you have to have the appropriate legislation to ensure that what we're doing is not illegal and will put us in trouble uh, with the elements of the constitution. If all of this works, including the political will, you get some outcomes out of it. Increased ICT access for all is important. Uh, you have reduced uh, digital skill and literacy divides. That is evident throughout the, the entirety of, of all of the Commonwealth in various forms and positions. We have uh, improved internal governance and efficiencies, uh, reduced bottlenecks and so on associated with that. Uh, we will and have to have a strengthened ICT legislative framework. And of course, we will have a stimulated economy. So starting from the top, the political will has to be there. The key stakeholders have to be involved. We have to partner. It has to be a willingness to withstand backlash when it happens and the resilience to be able to address anything that comes along, which would include cybersecurity breaches, all of that. How do you react? How do you manage? How do you take all of that forward while still engendering hope and trust in the population and the customers that we have? Without getting the red card, that's what I have. I hope it has worked with us. Thank you very much, Melissa. I have just one request. Please don't digitize PAN. We act, unfortunately, we have. Uh, Professor Copeland and the guys up at the university have already created a fan, and that is a digital pan. But we still have the old traditional way. So a bit late, but we've already done it. Let, let me pick up, you, you actually touched on the question that I was going to ask you, because working in many different parts of the world, I think there's a challenge with democracy. And that is almost always uh, the government in power gets replaced but sooner in some cases, later in others. And then very often in that process, digitalization and digital issues tend to become a political tool. You know, I will promise you X thousand laptops in your schools, for example. And, and I've seen all too often the policies, wise policies set in place by one government, then there's an election, they get forgotten because the new government wants to do something new. So my tough question for you, and I have to say I've been impressed in the times I've visited Trinidad and Tobago uh, uh, about actually how it seems you manage this reasonably well, but how do you get that long-term, you spoke about commitment, that long-term cross-party support in liberal democracies to achieve systemic change in digital technology? Yeah, it, it's a good question. In, in, in the digital space, strangely enough, it's been a lot simpler than it has been in other, in other industries. And that's simply because what, what, what has happened in the Trinidad and Tobago space, particularly with this government uh, spending back the fact that it's been now in two terms, is that they've created basically not just policy documents that would really form part of what they promised the population, but there are a number of published and established documents the Roadmap to Recovery document, the Vision 2030 document, the Replace the Vision 2020 document, the National ICT Plan document, 
there are a number of documents that are put together by academia uh, across uh, the divide of Trinidad and Tobago, partnerships with, with, with all the universities and uh, leaders of industry, uh, technocrats within the government. And what they've done is that they have created these roadmaps, if you will, that are basically non-governmental, but are really development documents for the country. And so all any incoming administration has to do is even if they want to change the, the focus of it, the bias in which one government may be doing something to the other, the general guidelines and, and, and outputs of that remain things that they generally tend to adhere to. So it's because it's created that way, that's why it works. Uh, you're on mute. You're on mute. Oh, I know. So, so there's a place for civil society and academia in providing some some value. I, I have to say, many of us here have been in this field for a long time. We see the same old stuff being rolled out time and time again in different policies. I mean, look at the UN Secretary General's roadmap for digital cooperation. Um, there's very little new in that. We're reinventing the wheel, moving on. But thank you for your intervention. Uh, I, I, I've taken away this point about having some external long term uh commitment in, in in the wider areas thank you without more ado i'm going to pass on to our second speaker professor avinash perso who is a uh, special envoy for the prime minister of barbados on investment and financial services and uh, perhaps we should say congratulations on the new status of your country uh, but we hope you will retain those strong links uh within the caribbean but but also with the commonwealth let me just hand over to you on uh, building the caribbean's economy a digital approach so uh, we've had the political will. We're now going to turn to you for some uh, economic insights. And again, uh, I please, I hope I don't have to use these. Avadash, over to you. Thank you for your congratulations. We are, of course, merely catching up at Trinidad and Tobago, who have been a republic for quite a few uh, decades now um, and performed well. So um, I'm going to talk a little bit about the Caribbean, but uh, and perhaps more so for my role as chair of the CARICOM Commission on the Economy, where digitization played an important part in our discussions about the future for the Caribbean. But, you know, development is global. It's not just about the Caribbean. Um, what is development? Development is um, uh, the, the ability of our people to be able to choose the life they wish to lead. Um, and um, that uh, applies in the Caribbean and it applies everywhere else. So I, I think what we have to say here uh, is fairly universal. Uh, the Caribbean is at a crossroads um, for the 20 years up to the late 1980s, early 1990s, we were the fastest growing region in the world. And that was partly a testament of big investments in public education, public health, um, and they were already showing a lot of dividends. But somewhere around the late 1980s, early 1990s, uh, we began to slip back relatively. We didn't notice it too much because in absolute terms, we were still growing. Um, and of course, the, the commodity countries like Trinidad and, and um, Jamaica and Guyana are sometimes on a different cycle, um, but uh, the region as a whole began slipping back. Today, we are the slowest growing region in the world. We are moving backwards relatively. Uh, for a region that had some of the most amazing public health uh, statistics, literacy, education, we're now uh, seriously slipping back. So what do we do about it? And, and clearly digital will play an important part of that story. But I think it's very important, and here I'm going to, to tread a little bit uh, on, on the minister's uh, turf because, you know, everything is political. Um, and it's important uh, that we have a reality check about digital because with every revolution, you have your zealots and that's good. You can't have a revolution without zealots. But the narrative is that digital is going to transform our economies, make us grow rapidly, it's going to be democratic, we're all going to benefit, and the only reason why we would not will be some laggards who uh, have the wrong culture, the wrong attitude, they're backward looking, uh, and I'm afraid uh, that is really completely myth. So the computer revolution has been here since the 1970s, the internet revolution from the 1990s, the Internet of Things may be the past 10 years or so. And despite these three waves of revolution, 
there's been no upward trajectory to world growth. There has been, this has not had any dividend in world growth. And indeed, since then, since those revolutions, perhaps coincidentally, income inequality has worsened in the world. Technology and digital has the capacity to bring many great things, but it also has the capacity to bring things that are not so great for some people. If uh, you, uh, the, all of us here, uh, taxi hailing services like uh, Uber are fantastic for us. They lower our cost, they increase our convenience. They're really bad if you're a taxi driver. Uh, and for those of us who like to travel around, um, these sort of home sharing sites like Airbnb are fantastic. They lower our costs, increase our opportunities. We can go and see all kinds of different things. Really bad if you're a hotel owner. Uh, so there are winners and losers. Uh, and in fact, the secret is if we want to win together is we need to identify the losers and we need to help the losers. We need to support the losers. That's why we have political obstacles to change. We have political obstacles to change, not because people are culturally backwards, but because they know they could be a loser. They feel threatened. Uh, and we need to disarm that threat uh, by investing heavily in, in, uh, in them. So, and digital can play an important role in that. So um, education is something that, that the Caribbean has long been a believer in. Uh, so Sir Arthur Lewis's words can be recanted by almost every school child in, in, Bar in the Caribbean, which is that the, um, the solution to poverty is not money, it is knowledge. He may actually have got that wrong, but anyway, we all know that. Uh, and and uh, so, you know, but we need to invest in a different kind of education. There's something that we've done here in Barbados where we've actually given every single citizen of Barbados by virtue of citizenship, free access to Coursera. Coursera gives them 50,000 courses on anything they want. We've transformed the way education is. Back in the old days, um, we used to have to kind of in the Caribbean think, what will people need? What skills will they need? There'll be tons of committees about identifying future skills, skill needs. We don't need to care about that now. People know what skills they need and people can go on these sites and they can pick whatever skill. We've had 22,000 people in the last few months sign up uh, to Coursera. 66,000 courses have been taken uh, and 3,800 of them have picked um, uh, coding with Java for uh, developing software apps. Uh, and nothing to do with government. They have decided that that's what they need. They've done it, we've facilitated. Um, I think digitizing government, which allows people to be able to use government services 24 hours, 24 by 7, is also an important way of giving uh, them greater access. Uh, but we have to think about um, in investing in people who may be losing. Um, and we have to think about, uh, about these new tools as rights. Uh, so uh, th there's a right to broadband. Uh, and that right doesn't mean that they can demand it for free, but government has to uh, invest heavily in giving great access and inexpensive access. Uh, as you know, one of the key uh, um, calls of the CARICOM Commission on the Economy was for a, um, a significant reduction in the barriers to roaming costs between the Caribbean. The Carib CARICOM is 15 sovereign states. Uh, if you go abroad with your phone on by accident, you may come back with a $6,000 bill, uh, as I once did, uh, for just a few days of roaming. So we want a uh, no sticker shot. We want, uh, we want, we're negotiating with the telecoms companies um, uh, on a single roaming rate or a roaming like home rate uh, and making good progress. And hopefully we can announce um, success uh, for 2022 on that. Um, so broadband, technology, digital, government, and education. These are all important rights. I want to end, uh, though, with, with making a, another political point, which is, um, imagine, Tim, uh, uh, and that the, uh, you owned a robot um, that can do everything, believe it or not, everything that you can do. That, you know, wakes up in the morning, comes down, cooks you the most perfect scrambled eggs, 
you know, packs off its bag, goes off to work, comes back at the end of the day, delivers you a check for the day's work. This is fantastic. You spend the day reading your books, going on Netflix, whatever you want to do. Fantastic. And your life is better off substantially. Now, imagine that same robot is owned by Microsoft. Suddenly, your life is totally different. Suddenly, you're working all the hours that exist in order to earn a little bit of money in between trying to do what you can do that the robot can't do. And so the key is not technology. The key is not the robot. The robot's the same in both worlds. The key is ownership. And we need to find, and I challenge all of the people on this call, new ways of ownership that will allow people to be able to own this technology. And therefore, that's the only way we are all going to benefit from it. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I've, I've been dipping out of the way because I've been taking copious notes of all my questions to be asking you. So I suddenly realize I'm disappearing. I, I Avinash, I had no idea we had so many things in common, but thank God there's not a robot anything like me. But we will uh, we will get on to that later. Uh, I'm going to pass on without more ado uh, to our next speaker, uh, who is Christopher McLaughlin. I had him down as Chris, but is, it says Christopher on there. So I, I need to keep things a little bit formal. Uh, thank you for joining us, Chris. Uh, you are Chief of Government Regulation and Engagement One Web. In case your robot, I didn't tell you that when you got up at whatever unearthly hour this morning to join us. We're really, really grateful. And um, sorry, it's only five minutes, but, but how can satellites really contribute, and particularly the new OneWeb constellations, contribute uh, to making this difference that uh, the, the right on Hassel Bacchus and Professor Perso uh, had to say. So five minutes over to you. Tim, it sounds like a challenging BBC programme of my youth. Um, I'm going to take the next four and a half minutes to speed along as I best can. Uh, Bernadette knows that I have a terrible half Irish gene, which enables me to talk forever on any subject without... Uh, Can I just interrupt you there? Uh, <laughs> my grandmother was Irish and I have my application in for full Irish citizenship, but it's got bogged in the system, Good. digital technology. Good man. Um, right, so this is a very, very exciting uh, time for OneWeb. Uh, we, as I've talked to Bernadette about before, came back from the dead. Uh, OneWeb had a horrific uh, near-death experience in March of last year, when the last two billion that was needed from our friends at SoftBank vanished in that vortex of COVID, when the whole financial world just imploded. Uh, the money wasn't there, and, and, and as I was explaining in the House of Commons this morning, in front of a select committee, um, I was asked if I could go to the British government and ask them, could we have a COVID loan? Only nobody knew what a COVID loan was at that time. And we then, by a process of, of elimination, ended up with the British government doing something it never does. And it took a $500 million equity stake in OneWeb alongside a company you all know as Airtel, which is um, Barty Global, led, led by Sunil Barty Mittal, which transformed the company. Because suddenly, from, as I like to say, the orphan waiting at the top of the hill for a car to come and pick them up, it had new parents, and the new parents said, yeah, but you haven't got enough money for your full uh, existence. But because of the strength of the new parents, we've attracted another $1.7 billion of inward investment. The company now has $2.7 billion of equity. And as a result of um, the Chapter 11 process, the $3.4 billion that went before to get it to where it is has gone to wherever money goes when it vanishes, but it's gone. And so OneWeb is now this wonderful creature with 358 of its satellites, 61% of its fleet up in space. It has um, a fully funded model for the whole of the 588 satellite network. Our next 34 satellites launch at the end of December. We're able to produce a satellite um, uh, once a day in our factory in uh, Florida uh, with Airbus. Uh, we have uniquely reduced the cost of getting into space uh, to Avnish's points earlier and to the, the minister's points. And we're in a very exciting position uh, for the Caribbean and for, the, um, for you all in general, uh, in that we've actually begun our first testing in uh, down to 50 degrees, um, obviously the frozen north and then down to the, the equally wet Great Britain, um, uh, to get the signals sorted. Um, we are now able to demonstrate uh, connectivity via Teams, 4K satellite um, delivered uh, YouTube video. Uh, we're able to 
uh, send email, we're able to do voice uh, over IP, uh, all the things that people want to bring them together and to empower in the way that Avnish was saying earlier and the minister was demanding earlier, OneWeb is offering. And as we roll out our satellites during the course of the next um, coming weeks, uh, sorry, weeks and months, um, we are going to be building on that footprint. In short, OneWeb, newly funded, ready to go with new shareholders, um, is in a position to say we will have a global network working by mid-year next year. And by the end of 2022, we are available to all citizens of the globe to be connected. How are we aiming to do that uh, in partnership? Our model is to work with the telecoms companies of uh, host nations. And so they can best determine how they want to reach their customers. We, we don't presume upon ourselves um, to know uh, what is the best way of delivering. So for example, uh, in, in Alaska, where we're doing some testing at the moment, we're with a, a very high north community in a place called Akiak, uh, where they have put a single uh, terminal in and they're using a WiMAX model to connect up all the uh, school and the village and, and the people in the village. And we're very, very interested in how that hub will work. With British Telecom, who've just begun testing in, a, in Great Britain, oh, one minute to go, we are, we are in a situation where they will determine what they want to do with the highlands and islands and the, the more remote areas. Um, so, so we're ready to work with you. We have a system that I know Bernadette and others have been looking for for some time, and we're terribly excited um, to be a bridge of connectivity to work with the Commonwealth Telecoms uni organization uh, to deliver for you. I'll hand you back five seconds. Thank you very much indeed. I always get these unions and organizations mixed up. It's uh, sorry. It, no, 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 no. I, yeah, and, as whether it's telecommunication or telecommunication. But thank you. And thank you for your enthusiasm and commitment. Uh, our final speaker is Peter Goodwin, who's the founder and CEO of Circle GX, who I think is joining us from somewhere in central USA, Peter. And sorry for any confusion over timing. It's great. Where's that great city in your backdrop? You're allowed to unknow it. Dallas, <laughs> Dallas, Texas. <laughs> Dallas, Texas, okay. <laughs> Great. So over to you. You've seen how it runs. Your your five minutes, and you're turning for uh, talking about sort of meaningful connectivity. What that really means? Well, <clears throat> meaningful connectivity, and in, and of course, you know, looking at what we've experienced here with the pandemic, uh, really means a lot now because now it has exposed in the United States some of the areas where you have unserved and underserved people. Our company is really focused on underserved and underserved people and bridging the digital divide in areas um, that really need uh, connectivity. You know, uniquely, um, just listening to uh, the gentleman from OneWeb uh, talk about what they're doing with the innovations there, all these things make a big difference in what we, we seem to believe is the democratization of technology and the opportunities that are, are uh, prevailing here. And at this crucible moment, you have this opportunity where you're seeing this, this quantum leap in technology um, happening at the same time the demand for connectivity has come to bear. And we started with 5G uh, back in 2013. And one of the things that we were thinking is that the, you know by moving from a proprietary hardware centric wireless infrastructure to a more software enabled programmable um, uh, infrastructure, uh, this was going to change the dynamics. Um, and when we became a, a part of the 50 founders for, um, for Dell, and one of the things that we were seeing, um, the reason why the operators went to them is that at the time, the hardware centric guys were really controlling uh, the cost of everything. And um, they wanted to move to uh, this, this whole software medium to uh, from the core and, and the RAN to a more democratized, uh, just running on basic uh, um, hardware. And of course, this changed the cost per seat from $30 per seat for new next generation infrastructure to $3. And so at the same time that this innovation is taking place, there's an opportunity here for the democratization of technology 
And now you're seeing, you know, we always talk about in telecom, um, it's a race to zero, right? Um, in terms of cost. And as these cost pressures are getting pressure, um, having the ability to be able to put out the you know, effective uh, infrastructure that's cost effective to the end user is, is a dynamic change. And we've seen that happen in several phases here in the United States in terms of uh, the first um, interruption that happened or disruption that happened with Craig McCall coming in. Uh, we also seen it with uh, Roger Lindquist with Metro PCS um, when he said, hey, look, we need people just need a phone to talk. Right. Um, and they were saying, well, no, you're going to make all of this investment. It's capital intensive and you've got all these big guys out there. And they're going to squash you. But um, as we see that this uh, innovation is coming in place, we now can fill the gaps. And, and I love what OneWeb is doing and uh, really like some of the things there, that's happening there. So it comes down to more than just connectivity. And if I were to say what is meaningful connectivity, I say this is the opportunity to take these uh, new technologies and these new innovations and be able to move them into an arena where you do more than just connectivity, but you create these ecosystems that are dynamic, that tie communities together in terms of their businesses and drive small businesses with the homes. And this is the, these are the type of innovations that we're working on in the United States, uh, launching in Dallas County, um, partnering with Qualcomm. And um, I'll leave you back some time to, um, so you don't get the red, I don't get the red signal. <laughs> <laughs> hey, I, people online, I mean, round of applause for our speakers. They all kept to time, so we have, that, that is brilliant. Congratulations. So um, I was asked to ask some tough questions. Uh, and, and, and so forgive me if, if these are a little bit challenging. And, I, I, and I'm gonna combine uh, Avinash and, and, and Peter's uh, ones in, into a question count. But first of all, Avinash, I mean, you come from a commercial, financial, economic background, and there you were saying everything is political. What well, I thought economists said everything is economics and that all that, that's all that matters. But, but that leads into the question I'm gonna ask you and Peter. Um, I was struck that you both focused on, on, on what I think, Peter, you called underserved. Uh, and, and, and Avinash, neither of you used the word inequality, I think, if I heard correctly. And, and uh, the focus on, on economic growth, that you know, the SDGs are fundamentally all about economic growth, and that is going to solve poverty. Uh, most people forget SDG 10. I wonder how many people actually participants go on, sign your name up in, in the chat if you know which SDG 10 is before I say it. It's about inequality. And the rest of the SDGs and SDG 10 to me are in conflict. So I want to shift us to inequality. And, and, and the real question is we know it costs more. The principle of equity is it costs more to reach the most marginalized. And we know, and Avinash, you sort of moved us a little bit into this, that, that actually the economic growth model causes inequality. If you have the latest, best new phone, you're gonna leap miles ahead of the person who still has an old, dare I say, 2G phone. I actually still have one, but that's another story. Um, so digital tech tends to increase inequalities and, or to be used to increase inequalities. So two, two aspects of this question, how do we change the global rhetoric away from economic growth to how digital tech can reduce inequality because well, I mean firstly I, I think Tim I, I would say that I, I did actually talk a bit about inequality about how in fact since the computer revolution the internet revolution I don't actually use the word but we'll we can yeah, check yeah, yeah, yes I did yes I did because it's very important it's a very important issue um, and it's a vital issue inequality has worsened I said uh, since the computer technology revolution and we have to ask ourselves because the narrative is that somehow this is democratizing. But I don't think technology has original sin. It's really about how we use it. Uh, and, and so uh, I don't think, I think that if we let leave it and don't do something about it, it will concentrate wealth and power and inequality. Uh, and therefore we have to actively work against it. And, and that's why I think uh, digitizing government actually improves access. You, you know, uh, we, we often say in Barbados when we talk about reforming government, what it means is 
a, a poor little girl from uh, one of our most remote town, uh, villages can get her planning application approved without her having to know various people, without her having to be able to take several days off work to line up. So, you know, digitization, digitizing government is actually about empowering citizens. Uh, and I think that uh, the final thing would be that we need to actively be thinking, to, to solve your problem, we need to actively be thinking about how technology can be used to reduce inequality, because if we don't do that, it reduces equality and increases inequality. I absolutely well, agree, uh, but let me, let me, I'll come to you, let me just, uh, for you to think about, maybe come up later, but of course, uh, you talk about the young person, my elderly mother, who's now had to go into a care home because she's got dementia, has been unable to use digital technology and fill in all the forms that she has to do online. So she's being further marginalized by e-government. And there are governments across the world who sell their NHS data and you have to sign on to an app to, 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 to get past. I would say one thing though, you know, we, we have a, a sort of, so in Barbados, we have one of the, the oldest uh, uh, social security systems set up in the, in the 1960s. Uh, and the, the, we, we were giving people checks. We were the, 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 we were the biggest users of checks. Uh, I was deputy chairman of it for a while. And the, the story used to be, well, these old people, you can't send the money online. They're not digital. They don't have a mobile phone. They don't have online banking. And they enjoy lining up in the bank uh, with their checks and chatting to their friends. Well, minute COVID happened, the concentration of people uh, using uh, checks was 80%. It collapsed to about from 80 to 20%. So. It actually showed what could happen if people were really pushed. Do you sell the your data of your health data of your citizens to private sector companies, for example? Thank goodness. No, but I think that we have to think. Uh, I, I once had a weird job, uh, and I only accepted it because the, it, it was housed in Admiralty Arch, uh, which is an amazing place in the UK, and it was uh, the UK's public sector information committee. And the big choice is. Should governments provide that in a fair bit of information for free, the American model, and then allow the private sector to build all kinds of apps on it, as long as privacy is maintained, of course, or, or should we charge for it? The UK model was charging, ordnance survey, hydrology, charges for data. The US, that data is free. And I think you really need to go towards seeing how we can send more data freely available, usable, because then you'll get a, a whole industry of useful applications built on right. that. Take it. Well, I want to take a, I'd like to take a different twist. I want to take a different twist here because when you talk about the inequality, that's Circle GX was built all around that. So let's, let's just break it down into a community like a Dallas County, right? In Dallas County, you have 940,000 households, right? 14% of these households qualify for a subsidy that the government offers to provide them with free service, right? But in essence, if you look at the benefits that come from this, this new generation technology and the capabilities that it has, what you have going on is the ability to be able to reduce the cost to everyone by being able to take this cost reduction, right? So now 940,000 households is spending $220 million a month for communication services, right? So not only do you have the unserved and the underserved, you have overpriced. And so by putting green fields of new infrastructure in, what you have the opportunity to do is reduce the overall cost. And at the same time, by the government's participation in helping put out these big, 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 big um, funds like the infrastructure funds, the ARPA funds, and all of that that have come out, you now, by, by serving the unserved and the underserved and, and finding this equality that you're talking about, you have the ability to provide the city with better efficiencies in terms of energy consumption and water consumption and all of the things that they do, the waste things uh, in terms of uh, the smart city overlay, overlay that you put into these infrastructures. So in our model, we see that there's a grand opportunity in the transformation of looking how dollars are spent from community and, and what we're seeing is, is that the money is leaving the community. And if you could build a green field, maybe you can get half of that $220 million back. And this is how we've built the partnerships to go forward throughout the United States and partner with Qualcomm. And if you could deliver 
for the most marginalized more cheaply. You undercut, of course, everyone else who is charging more and then therefore you can make it work. I, you race to zero. It's a race to zero, right? <laughs> I mean, I mean, where well, everyone's is gonna make, business? Everyone's right? got to make a little bills. bit of profit. You've got everyone's right, yeah. going to have something in it. <laughs> but, right. but you mentioned that magic word green. So, Chris, and I think this is a horribly tough question for you. Um, almost nobody's done any work on the environmental impact of satellites. Uh, and and, and I, I, I've been fascinated in recent years by uh, the, the models of how digital tech in general affects the environment. Uh, and there are a lot of works, but nearly all of that focuses on, you know, we've had COP26 recently, on carbon. Uh, but, but we've been starting doing some modeling around the environmental impact of that, and that's in there. How do we treat outer space? Most people treat it like the, like, um, the oceans used to be treated. They're just bung up satellites in there. I'm not saying you're doing that. That's a bit of a harsh view. But, but, but have you thought about the environmental impact of your work? And that actually then broadens out to a, an environmental question for other people, uh, on, on other speakers. Uh, because of course, uh, the SIDS, the small island developing states, and this brings us back to the Caribbean, are some of the most vulnerable to environmental change. So I, I, I'm just fascinated to know whether uh, at OneWeb you, you have, have actually developed means of uh, understanding the environmental impact of what you do. Tim, it's a very good question. I, I thought I'd done all my bear baiting in Westminster this morning, but um, I'm delighted to, to step in on this one as well. The, the, the fact of the matter is that um, a satellite launch in and of itself uh, obviously uses fuel to escape the Earth's gravity and then to get out. And um, you either with Elon Musk have a returnable uh, rocket, which he then refurbishes and flies eight or nine times. So he's got a leap on the technology. Or if you're Ariana Spass or some of the others, they haven't got that technology yet. And it descends and it gets dealt with in a different way. Um, there's an impact on launches, but the you then have to say to yourself, so there is an impact at launch, but you've then got five or 10 or 15 years of operation from that one launch. So, you know, in, in, in my classic, uh, I, I was never a particularly good LSE student, but in my classic days, um, I, I would say, well, you could amortize the whole thing over that period of time for the good that it does. So then you might look at, well, what does that connectivity do? Has it given the islands, um, uh, to, to come to the specific point that, that Mark and others had asked, um, has it given the islands a degree of um, uh, resilience? Has it over and above given them something that they can do something with in moments of, of crisis? And I, I would argue that adding a satellite layer to your telecoms is a smart thing to do because if you're if you have your only infrastructure is a, a user tele uh, user terminal, you're in a pretty good place. Um, we, we've seen time and again satellite comms being the only thing that can be used in disaster recovery, also for governments and, and, and good governance as well. We've also seen satellites, frankly, used for um, uh, election results in, in some places like the Philippines, where it's the only way to get all of those election results in in time. So to, to, earlier, to earlier points of the minister and, and to Avnish, um, it's a, it is about democratization. There is an environmental impact, obviously. And one of the big challenges that has to, and, and you've got to trade off that, one of the big challenges for the world now is, are we going to go forward in this new ocean with only countries being able to chuck up as many as they want to and nobody dealing anything with it? Or are we going to say, you know what, we do actually need an international maritime organization of space uh, because I think the IMO was a, a, a brilliant uh, invention. And when will the FCC, the Chinese, the British, the Canadians, the Indians all go, you know what, we think we're all better if we're in one place. I mean, for example, OneWeb, is 588 satellites in Gen 1. It may well be less satellites in Gen 2. It certainly won't be thousands. Mr. Musk has gone on a different model, which is, oh, um, I'm going to put 1,400 at um, 550 kilometers. Oh, actually, I've got a better idea. I'm going to put 4,400. Oh, I've got an even better idea with FCC. Um, uh, yeah, I know I'm in trouble. Uh, I'm going to put 30,000 up. Uh, we can't go on like that. And when, when Mr. Bezos joins in, it's going to get pretty crowded. Sorry, I, I stepped back. Uh, exactly, and, and, and thank you. I, I do think the ITU, the International Telecommunication Union, is trying to be that. Be that. And of course, we, we won't mention you. I don't think you mentioned the word Russia in what you've just said and uh, the fun, <laughs> the damage that they're causing. Anyway, park that. So I'm going to turn to uh, the chats. We have got 
question coming up and uh, I think Mark has, has got one and it's also uh, for, for you, Chris. Uh, and and you know, I think many of us in the CTO over many years have been passionate about the role that uh, uh, satellites can play in some of the most marginalized areas, so island states, peripheral parts, uh, but also in, in interiors of countries where uh, the fiber doesn't necessarily reach. So Mark's ask, uh, how easy is it for community network projects in remote areas in LDCs and SIDS to obtain cheap satellite connectivity for internet access? I, I, I think you actually technically answered that. And really it's probably a question of political will, but if you've got just one or two words you'd like to say, and then the honorable minister is also here. So I might turn to him on that. So, so I, I, I would, Turn to the minister, but uh, the way that we're approaching it in in OneWeb is, we'll provide the connectivity. You will decide on your social goals and what you want to do through your telecoms people. For example, in the UK, they have a five billion broadband fund that they're investing, but a lot of that is going into fiber networks and into uh, solid presence. But maybe the minister has a, a better guide for us. Sure. Uh, just just to touch on it quickly, the. the the conversation that was happening about uh, inequalities is, is a significant one. Uh, when you consider being, I, I went the other way. I went from, from private industry and from telecoms and ICT into government. So it's a little bit different for me. But just, just think about it. Te technology is considered both sword and shield uh, across the world. It, it's, it's, it's a great equalizing thing when you can say, and using the same example that a little girl somewhere in a rural village now has access to all the things that they need because they don't have to go buy an encyclopedia set. But it can also be a very limiting thing when that same little girl has no access. And Trinidad has 400,000 homes. The, the Telecommunications Authority does uh, is currently doing a digital inclusion uh, survey. They've already done one. And 80% of those, uh, over 80% of those have access to broadband. The question is, is it appropriate broadband and is it capable broadband given what is required to be done now? So what has the government done? It's done a couple of things. One, having access to broadband and not knowing how to use it is terrible. So they've created access centers where people can go, whether you have devices, don't have devices and, and you can get either training or access to services in that way. Uh, they've also created specific programs through the Telecommunications Authority to address all of those areas that have that were once served, that have now become underserved, that have never been served, and otherwise. And that's why what OneWeb is doing is actually key. Even for a country like Trinidad and Tobago, that has fiber in a lot of places, that there's still very remote places that, that are pockets of people that deserve to have the same uh, levels of, of broadband connectivity, given the, given the idea that we have already promoted it as a public good. So it's government policy that will define that with government funds behind it in a lot of cases. Kim, can I just mention one thing um, on the... Uh... Sorry, Avinash, I'm going to have to close because I want to give the final word to, to the SG. But before I do that, if you all switch your screens to gallery view, that's a little button at the top right hand side. And while you do that, if you go also to the reactions at the bottom, wouldn't it be great if everybody who enjoyed this session uh, did a little clap symbol in the top of their screen to thank our wonderful speakers. So uh, there we are. Thank you, Kia Mogetswe and Shelly Ann and Gabrielle. Uh, I, I will just do it like this as well. But thank you all for being so wonderful. Uh, before I hand over to uh, the SG for some final words, uh, I, I was asked to try and summarize this. Completely impossible. You're all far too good for that. But let me just draw four, I think, key points out. The first is politics matters. And it was lovely to hear you, Avinash, stressing that, uh, and Honourable Hassel Bacchus for, for, for emphasising that. Was it? Politics matters. We have to have educated politicians who can really drive this agenda forward, who understand what tech can do, and who work in the interests of the poorest and the most marginalised. Secondly, I think we heard both with OneWeb and, and you, Peter, uh, about we need new business models. It is possible to achieve this, but we need creative thinking, stepping away from some of the old business models. Third, I brought in, and, and again, thanks, Peter, for mentioning the word green, but these issues of sustainability. We do have to have much, much better models of evaluating the environmental sustainability of digital tech. And then finally, just 
I, I think you're all more positive than I am. That's probably a good thing. I think I'm probably older than you all are. So, uh, you know, this, this is you know, a boring, old, middle-aged white man saying it. But I look at the harms more. I know the goods, but because I can also see the harm that digital tech can do. I've, I've become very much a person who pushes that out. SG, uh, thank you for inviting me to lead this. Thank discussion. you very much, Tim. You did an excellent solution. And all that is really left for me to do is to thank our Tim. To, to thank you, Tim. That was too much. It closed the mic down. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Bernadette, can you hear us? You, we, we've lost you. She's got a delay. And uh, she... Yes, you're back on, Bernadette. I'm afraid that horrible thing... On mute. You're on mute as well. <clears throat> Bottom left of your screen. I muted myself. I don't know what happened, but I was thanking our excellent provocateur and also our panelists for the insight. Some very important points, I believe, have come out of our discourse and of digital transformation from the Republic of Trinidad and Tobago. Professor Avinash Prasad, he's a special envoy to the Prime Minister of the Republic of Barbados on investment and financial services. Um, uh, Mr. Chris McLaughlin, thank you so much, Chief of Government and Regulations and Engagement of OneWeb. And Mr. Peter Goodwin, founder and CEO of Circle G GX. And to our audience from around the world, we thank you for joining and participating in the Commonwealth Telecommunications Organization's first hard talk for action discourse and it's 11 o'clock this brings us to the end of our session thank you all